Hi, everyone. Welcome to day two of XFileCon. Hopefully, you've been having a good time yesterday and seeing all the new things we've finally been able to bring to light for you. My name is Reese Abraham. I'm one of the senior programmers at Grinding Gear Games. And today, I would like to talk to you a little bit about the past, present, and future of Path of Exile's procedural world generation systems. So random level generation is actually really important for Path of Exile. It is one of our key design pillars. It plays a huge role in providing replayability and giving people new things to, dis to discover and explore, even on multiple playthroughs. Every good ARPG should have random level generation if they expect players to play through multiple times. So right from the beginning, we knew we needed good li random level generation. When I first joined GGG 11 years ago in 2008, my first task as a junior programmer was to implement a random dungeon generator. This is probably not something we would give to a junior programmer these days, but you know, back then the team was small. So after a few short months, we were proud. We were so proud to show off this version 020 at our office Christmas party. This was a huge milestone, our first playable demo of the game for our friends and family in all its inverted normal map glory. And over time, we continued to improve and upgrade the game engine and the terrain engine. Almost every league and expansion we've ever done has brought some kind of new improvements to the random level generation systems. Shrines, foul side areas, the original Forsaken Master missions, the Labyrinth, the Atlas, Abyss, Bestiary, Incursion, Delve, Betrayal, Delve, Synthesis, Blight, even the upcoming Metamorph and um, Conquerors of the Atlas expansion has, some, has a few new things. And of course, in Path of Exile 2, we're going even further. But before we get to that, we're going to go over the basics of the terrain uh, system. There is a lot of detail we could cover, but I'm just going to give you a broad overview. So first of all, we are using tile-based environmental geometry. Every beach, every forest, every city, every twisted demon world is subdivided into square or occasionally rectangular terrain tiles. There are some technical reasons for this, like performance, but it also lets us break down the world into conceptual small pieces, that we, little puzzle pieces that we can assemble together to bring everything together and uh, make the worlds that you see. So. Here is a river tile, the side of a river. Got water, some land. In the blue, you can see our construct, uh, the connection silhouette, which is how our environment artists make sure that adjacent tiles line up correctly and connect together without any gaps. Our level designers then take the raw art and using our tile editing tool that, you can, that this is a screenshot from, they can mark it up with ground types, edge types, and connection points as well as painting the walkability and height grid. On the right, you can see the green, that's the walkable area. The yellow is the unwalkable water and part of the embankment there. And on some tiles, we can also paint in, in red, places where the terrain is very tall, like a tree or a wall, and therefore should block projectiles or stop players using leap slam and that kind of thing. So tile keys are a very important part of our system. A tile key is an abstract representation of the tile and what it means semantically. It is defined by the tile's size, edge connections, and what's going on at the corners. So again, this is a, a river tile. It connects to other river tiles. The geometry has to line up. Two of the corners are in the water, two corners are on the land. The tile key is used by the system so we can look up the tile we need to create the geometry we need. So, for example, if we're creating the curve of a river, we can approximate that curve using squares, square tile keys, and align the connection points to approximate the spline, then create a tile key from that and look up what tiles we have. We can also create multiple tiles, multiple art variations that have the same tile key, and then we can create micro variation by randomizing between those because we know that they'll all work, because they all have the same connection silhouettes. 
but tiles alone are not really flexible enough to do everything we need. So we have rooms, so-called because you know, everything started from a dungeon generator, which is basically just a manual arrangement of tiles. We can combine them together, we can create literal rooms, but we can also create things for outdoor areas as well. The room has connection points similar to a tile. For example, places where doors can go. Usually, we don't actually place door tiles manually. We assign connection points where doors could spawn as needed. So, an important feature here is that the room is actually not made of tiles. The room is made of tile keys. This is important, as you'll see soon. It does mean, though, that in the tool, the room editor, which is what we see here, what you see is not necessarily what you get, because there can be micro variation in the tiles. This means that our level designers have to be a little bit careful, because they, it's very tempting you know, to take a, a nice couch, for example, and put it up against a wall. Looks good, right? But that wall could be randomly turned into a pillar, and then you have a pillar in the middle of your couch. So we need to avoid that. The, the, uh, the level designers also can decorate rooms with like blood splashes, decals, various doodads and things, as well as monster packs, treasure chests, various quest items. There's a lot we can do. It's very powerful. Here's an example of an outdoor room. I think this is the entrance to the, to the red veil. So, yeah, we use rooms everywhere, not just for dungeons, also for outdoor, outdoor rooms. Okay, so outdoor areas. This may look intimidating, but it's actually the, the simpler part of the system. Out, we have a special gener uh, outdoor generation algorithm that is used for natural formations like rivers, cliffs, shoreline, that kind of thing. We start with a graph on the right, nodes and edges. We define all the special locations, things like the entrance, the exit, boss fights, quest locations, that kind of thing, as well as more general points where edges of different types come together and join. Each edge has its own type. You can see the blue edge is the river, the green edge is the, is the forest, the kind of gray edge is the chopped trees, and the brown path is the mud burrower's trail. So, there's quite a complex algorithm we go through to convert, go from start to finish. Um, but I'll just briefly give you an idea. Uh, I don't want to talk for like four days, so. We start with the nodes. We move them around randomly, we shuffle them, and then we pathfind along each edge through a weighted grid to create a random path between the nodes. This path is then turned into a spline, and as, as I said before, we approximate the spline using square tile keys and align the connection points to fit the spline. We can then look up all the tiles, perhaps with micro variation, and then that creates all our edges. There is often a lot of empty space in between the edges, so we fill it in. For the forest and chopped forest areas and for water and stuff, it doesn't usually matter too much, we just fill it in with the same, same tiles. For the walkable area, we usually create a, a bunch of random fill tiles or fill rooms with more interesting stuff going on for players to walk around and interact with. So that's the simple stuff. Dungeons. So dungeons are, use a pretty similar system. We start with the graph. Uh, we add all the important locations. But there are some important differences. Here you can see the, the crypt, I think, is the crypt area from Path of Exile 2. You can see the black edges are like lines of abyss, and the thick gray edge is the walkable path through the area. Note that these edges can actually over, uh, cross over each other. In 
and outdoor areas, the edges kind of represent a more concrete path of tiles. So they can't cross. But in dungeons, the paths are a little bit more abstract. The dungeon graph does not actually map straight into tiles. A dungeon is made of rooms. And when we're creating the dungeon edges, we're not really going along the edge, adding rooms to it. We're opening room connections along the edge, and then multiple edges can affect the same rooms, and then we have to find rooms of the right combinations. This particular graph is not super random, which is why I chose it. So you can sort of see the graph next to the final result and see that it kind of lines up. But we can do lots of crazy stuff with this. The edges can pretty much go anywhere if we let them. And so here is the room layout. With, in blue is the, uh, the main traversable path. So once we have our room layout, which is where all the rooms are, how they connect, it should be easy, right, to turn that into tiles. A room is literally a connection, uh, an arrangement of tiles. So can't we just convert that into tiles? Well, of course we can. But that's really simple. That's, we, we can do better, you know. Most games that have procedural dungeon generation will create rooms, stick them next to each other, and then in order to connect them, they'll have to add some kind of door or have some kind of standardized connection template or something. And you know, we, we can do that, we can do that. But it makes the room boundaries very obvious, especially when you're looking at a bird's, from a bird's eye view, but um, even from the in-game in camera, it makes, it makes the rooms very, um, you know, gamey. So here you can see two rooms that have been kind of merged together. What we actually do is define our rooms to overlap in space by one tile key. And because rooms are made of tile keys, not exact tiles, then we can actually combine the tile keys together and we can define rules for how they combine, and then use that, use the combined tile keys to look up new tiles to merge the rooms together seamlessly. Here, for example, we have like this thick wall between those two rooms that are just adjacent to each other, but we can make, create a thin wall by overlapping two back-to-back -back thick walls. Another option is that we can say, two walls combine into nothing. In this case, when two rooms are adjacent, they overlap. We put literally just blank space in between them, and effectively this, the rooms merge together and form one larger room. But we can go even further. We can use custom overlap combinations, and this is a very powerful tool. Our level designers use this pretty much everywhere that isn't an outdoor generation level. And you can do some really amazing stuff with it. Like this screenshot here. This is from the village, the burning village, from the demo towards the end of it. Like, does that look like a dungeon? There's like trees, there's a forest over there, there's fields of wheat in the back, there's a bunch of buildings of various shapes on the, on the left there. Like, can you even see where the rooms are? Not easy. But we can, we use the overlap and like, it's really amazing what some of our level designers can put together with it. For example, the buildings. We actually have two or three, I think, building edge types that define different levels of destruction on the buildings. And so we can create rooms that have partial, partial building structures and destroyed building connection points, and they all overlap together to form like random, randomly destroyed buildings. It's actually very elegant because the system we use also ensures that there is a guaranteed walkable path through everything. But 
this is even just scratching the surface. The, uh, the mines, the mines in the old Act 4 actually use this a lot because the mines have like, like the, the cart rails, they have abyss, they have platforms, normal ground, like everything all combines together to make it all seamless. But I'm trying to show you guys new content, so. Okay. Small confession, the system isn't perfect. Sometimes things go wrong, you know. Maybe you've seen a few screenshots on Reddit of the train generation running wild. That's my fault. The theory is the server generates the area first because, you know, we have server client architecture. And the server is meant to do all the validation. It checks that everything connects properly, that you can walk through the level, that everything makes sense, you know. As it goes through the train generation process, if it finds a problem that cannot be resolved, it restarts the entire train generation with a different seed. That may sound inefficient. However, the algorithm only takes like 20 milliseconds, so it's not really a big deal. As long as the success rate is reasonable, you know. And by and large, I think the vast majority of our levels have like a 90% plus success rate. This screenshot here is um, an example of a failed generation. The two rooms in the middle are too close, and so it cannot create the edges between them that it needs. Maybe we could try something to um, move those nodes apart or something, but also restarting is a good enough solution for now. This system also means that we can send only the successful seed to the client. So the client's terrain generation never fails, unless there's a bug. It happens. And then finally, we hash the final tile placement on server and client to make sure that they're in sync. If you've ever seen an error message where you fail to join an area because the terrain generator is out of sync, that's also me. Those bugs are really hard to track down, by the way. I need, like, lots of logs. OK. Shall we have a look at some of the new stuff we're doing in Path of Excel 2? OK. So, new world map. Did you notice it's randomly generated? Yeah. So, every character gets their own personalized, randomized world map. This means, of course, we have to use a bit of a more abstract art style, but it still looks pretty good. Uh, we can, it means we no longer canonically say that the manor is to the north of the village, for example, because it's different for every character now. In addition, the direction of the connections that you see on your world map match what you find in the 3D world. So here you can see my character standing in town. And to the bottom right is the exit to the next area, to Clearfell. But other characters, they might have a different direction. So they, those characters will need to physically walk to a different place in town to use the other exits. If, your character ha if you go to the wrong exit on your character, you will find it blocked by boxes or whatever. So generally, you can use the world map to guide you through the game. Although I will say there are a few specific areas where we've deliberately made it a little bit harder. So yeah, we enjoy suffering. <laughs> OK. This is, might be one of my favorite new features, camera facing tile geometry. Having tall, epic tiles is awesome, and the environment artists love doing it as well. However, they block the camera. So we have a new system that lets us selectively hide the top half of terrain tiles based on what direction they're facing in regard to the camera. Tiles facing down screen can be tall. Tiles facing up screen are much shorter. 
This screenshot is from the mud burrow, where we're, where we're using this to make the area feel more claustrophobic. But we're also using it in other areas. This is the manor, the, the iron manor, which is the final area of Act 1 in Path of Exile 2, also the final area of the demo if you get up to it. Here you can see a screenshot from, from our planning phase. The geometry in blue will be removed when the tiles are facing the wrong direction. And here's the final tile art. We also have special diagonal pieces of geometry that are used when the tile is facing sideways to blend between the up screen and the down screen. Okay, so we have roads. You've probably seen them. They're not amazing, to be honest. Um, you can see the graph there. The road is actually two edges, one for each side of it. And we try, I swear, we really try to keep those edges nicely together. But it's not perfect. This isn't even the worst screenshot I could find, you know? So for Path of Exile 2, we, we really want to improve this. And the core problem is basically that the road is two edges. It needs to be a single edge using larger tiles where we have full control over the width of the road. So in Path of Exile 2, that's what we're doing. Better, right? So how are we doing this? We have 3x3 three three square tiles instead of 1x1 one one tiles. On the left, uh, in the before columns, you can see what the road looks like when we make it out of those. And it's, it's a good width, but it's still a bit square and blocky. So we do a second pass. We create larger, cur nicer curved tiles and then place them over top using a kind of pattern matching algorithm. Here you can see all of the road connections for these shapes are identical, but the after ones have a much nicer curve. And here you can see those highlighted and in practice. I'm pretty happy with the results. But this pattern matching system is actually more general. We can use it for more things. So here I've highlighted in the white boxes how we're using pattern matching overlay rooms to add new terrain features adjacent to the edges we create with the graph. There's a lot of potential for this going forward. And we're really just scratching the surface. I'm pretty interested to see what our level designers are capable of using this new technology. For example, in an area like the old riverways, for example, when you're crossing the rivers, currently we place broken bridges and unbroken bridges manually in the graph. But with this, with this system, we don't need to do that. We can just place a single unbroken bridge to guarantee traversability, and then use overlays to randomly add other bridges which may or may not be broken. But there's a lot of scope. I'm, I really want to see what our guys can do. OK, so another feature is dynamic footstep sounds. Previously, there was one footstep sound. Now, in Path of Exile 2, the sound will be based on what visual material you are stepping on. This is a screenshot from the first town. On the left is kind of a rocky, gravelly the entrance, and then there's the wooden bridge, and then the main town area is like dirt. So why can't we just play different sounds? Well, now we can. We have a pre-processing step where we run a tool on every tile in the game, and we have like 15,000 tiles and more coming. So, you know, it takes a while, but here you can see a visual visualization of the walkable materials at every location in the town. I'm not actually 100% sure if this is in the demo. I was trying so hard to get it in the demo. Does anyone know if it actually works? Yes. 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 <laughs> I, 
I'm glad you noticed. Okay, so slightly more tangentially related to the terrain, but we are trying to step up our game with the NPCs in Path of Exile 2. You probably saw when you entered town, Renly was waiting for you at the entrance. After you finished talking to him, he walked up to his usual spot in his workshop next to the anvil. And other NPCs are more dynamic as well. If you do Una's side quest, she gains a loot and will play music for you. And later on in the act, there are more NPCs who will help you out during the quests, follow you around, and it turns out creating pathfinding during random terrain is a bit tricky, but we're working on it. You probably saw the Crowbell fight during the keynote presentation. That's an example. But I don't want to spoil everything. So. That is basically it for today. Thank you for your attention. If you want to discuss terrain generation algorithm with, algorithm, algorithms with me, please email me. I'm very friendly, I, I promise. Thank you. All right, it's time for some uh, questions. If Josh? you're not familiar. Go to the link above and submit us some questions. We've already got a ton coming in, uh, so we're going to get started right now. Before we do, though, I have to say, awesome talk. I've worked in the terrain generation code once, and it absolutely terrified me. I had to get Reese to handhold me the whole way through. So, uh, First question up we've got here is, uh, can you talk about the root cause of most of the unreachable item bugs? OK. Um, oh, the item bugs. The, oh, the loot. Yeah, when they kind of fall outside of the pathable terrain, and so you can't click them. Well, you can click them, but you can't pick there them are up. Yeah, OK. There are two main reasons for this. The first is that sometimes there are little pockets of walkable terrain, which are not actually accessible, and sometimes not even accessible with Leap Slam or Blink Arrow or something. This is generally due to problems with the painted walkability in the tiles that you saw earlier. And so, if you see it, type slash bug, and we can look into it. The other type of problem is when, when you kill a monster that is in the middle of a leap slam over an abyss or something. And then the items drop at the monster's location, which is unworkable to the player. Yeah, we should fix that. <laughs> Your gameplay, right? Yeah, all right, I'll, uh, I'll make a ticket for it on Monday once I <laughs> eventually arrive after the after party. <laughs> uh, currently, a lot of Path of Exile maps feel quite flat. Are we looking at having more vertical map variation uh, for Path of Exile 2? In Path of Exile 2, we are adding a lot of new tile sets. Uh, I guess the manor has... Um, has a bit of verticality. There's a few places where you can uh, look down through the destroyed floor into the areas below. Um, and, and there are a few maps, like maybe the, uh, the aqueduct and the waterways tile sets have a pretty good feeling there. I'm keen for more. The train generation system supports it. It's just a matter of getting the environment artists on board and making sure the performance is good. Awesome. I'm sure a lot of people would be happy to hear that. Um, how does the new world map generation function for parties? Parties, yes. Um, that's a good question. We haven't fully decided, but probably the easiest way to do it is just we use the party leader. And then they can see where to go, and everyone else follows the leader. I think that's probably the simplest and most intuitive way to do it. But we'll discuss it. Yeah, for sure. And actually, kind of like slightly following on from that, are the world maps uh, generated like kind of per instance, per character, per account? Per, per character. They're, based, they're seeded based on your character ID. So every new character you make will have a different map. Awesome. Uh, next up, are the treasure chests, rocks, barrels, and other interactable objects that we put inside of a room 
uh, they're on spawn points, or are they spawned through the generation system? So treasure chests and actually monsters are kind of spawned in the same way. We have two ways to do it. In every room, we can place manual spawn markers. These markers can either be a mandatory chest or a potential chest spawn location. We can also scatter them about randomly during the level just by picking random coordinates. There are two ways that we spawn chests and monsters. And they both have trade-offs. So the first is to have a target number of monsters or a target number of chests and then distribute them over the level, whatever the level may be. The balance guys love this. It lets them balance the player progression curve and the amount of loot people are getting very nicely. The other way is to just use the spawn markers that we place in the room to spawn everything, and then the amount of stuff spawned is relative to the area, the geometric area of the level. This means that when the area is small, it has the same density as when it's big. But if we do it the other way around, a small area is more dense and a large area is more sparse. So there's trade-offs. Typically, I think um, in-game maps take the more balance-oriented approach where we try to spawn a fixed number of monsters per area and scatter them about as needed. And then we try to control the geometric area to be within a certain, to be within target size, like plus or minus 10% or 20% or something. Awesome. Uh, ooh, next up, we have, uh, will the new world generation tech we've made for uh, Path of Exile 2 also be present in the old campaign? Mostly not. Um, we have a lot of existing areas in the game, over a thousand, in fact, and going back and adding new tech to them is a lot of work. Much easier to, add, to just use it for the new content we're producing. However, some, there are a, f a few things um, that might be backported for new areas in future 3.x content, like the tile overlays. Awesome. Um, you've been with Grinding Gear for a, a very long time. I believe you remember the garage days. Yeah, when I first joined the company, we were literally in Chris's garage. There was only like six or seven of us there at the time, and maybe a few people overseas. So I've been there over 11 years now. Yeah, in those uh, 11 years, is there a moment that you remember as kind of your proudest, proudest moment as a developer? I think the, the initial release of the game in 2013, we had a big party and that was pretty amazing to actually, to be able to say, it's out. We made a game. That was what, like Act 3.X? Yeah, yeah, I believe so. Adding Dominus, yeah. yeah. All right, what else have we got here? Uh, if town accents are going to be random, does this mean that every player in the town is going to be running at a wall and then disappearing as opposed to leaving from an exit that you can see? Yes. <laughs> we have special, um, special doodads and decorations at all the entrances that we can turn on or off based on whether that entrance should be available to your character. So, I said we would block it off with boxes, but I mean, maybe we should have something else. Maybe we should have something like, I don't know, an NPC or like yeah, something to using, make it look better. Um, we're using Eric's new kind of uh, door glow tech to sort of indicate the one that's working as opposed to the one that isn't. Yes. We actually, yeah, we have new, I um, can't believe I didn't mention this in the talk, but we got rid of those hard white area transitions. Finally. <laughs> That's been a long time coming, actually. But yeah, now, now that we're creating new content as opposed to revamping old content, it's much easier to add these kind of things. Yeah, awesome. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Next up we have, uh, how is the lighting done? I think. Alexander's going to talk about this a little bit later, but can you talk about it in relation to like each of the tiles and how they get light with the generation system? So the lighting, 
the lighting has actually changed a lot, over, especially in the last couple of years. Um, it used to be that every area had a fixed lighting setup, which, which worked for a while, but um, we have much better control these days. We can create custom bounding boxes with different environmental settings, different lighting settings, and blend between them as you walk in and out of them. So, I'm not sure if there's any good examples in 4.0. We use it a lot to change the music and sometimes even the lighting when a boss spawns, for example. If you've fought the Rust King, that might be a good, good example of that happening. Yeah, and if you are interested in lighting, uh, Alexander, our lead graphics programmer, is going to be doing a big old talk about all the rendering stuff, and there's a ton of stuff on all the different lighting systems there uh, towards the end of the day. Uh, let's talk betrayal briefly, uh, specifically the inaccessible syndicate camps. Can you talk about uh, why they might happen and also what makes them so difficult to fix? Betrayal has some special terrain tech dedicated exclusively to betrayal. The fortification encounters often are really big, much bigger than any other um, randomly spawning terrain feature. So we added new tech to try to spawn them um, without requiring level designers to manually go through every area in the game and manually create uh, places for them to spawn. And, you know, for the most part it works. Um, and since Betrayal League, we have improved that more. However, in 3.8 specifically, in that patch, we actually regressed a little bit on some of the spawning algorithms. It's actually really hard sometimes to make changes to the terrain generation simply because we have so many existing areas that rely on various small bits of logic that like, even I'm not aware of. We have four level designers, they build areas. They don't always tell me every single thing they're doing, of course, but sometimes they end up relying on some like small quirk of the terrain generation that I might regard as a bug. And then when I fix it, suddenly a bunch of areas break. So that will be fixed in 3.9, or at least vastly improved, yes. Yeah, there's definitely sometimes a policy between uh, programmers and uh, the designers of Don't Ask and, uh, and, and figure it out later. <laughs> Well, I don't expect them to be constantly bothering me. In fact, I prefer they didn't. Yeah, it'd be really <laughs> annoying, right? Uh, okay. Let's see. Uh, what kind of uh, education degree or degree do you think would be the best to prepare someone to do this kind of work uh, or to end up in a role similar to your own? Well, I did a computer science degree at Otago University in the South Island. And then I pretty much moved straight into GDG after that. Um, certainly having a strong grasp of algorithms is very useful, um, but probably the single best thing you can do if you want to join our company is to make things yourself in your spare time. Make it like a hobby project. Make your own game. There are a lot of tools out there that let you, you know, using scripting and stuff, you can create a game just by yourself. It doesn't have to have amazing graphics. It doesn't need sound. It just has to be playable. And that is actually the most impressive thing. A lot of our job applicants have done that, myself included. Yeah, definitely. I know that uh, one of our environment artists rebuilt Line Eyes Watch in Unreal, and that was kind of how he got in, despite having not done a lot of study on that. And uh, Fogg, who made, uh, who read Coward's Trial and also uh, made the Devourer boss that you can see in the Path of Exile 2 demo right now, uh, he was just doing Diablo 2 mods um, and he uh, happened to apply to us, and Chris took one look and said, yeah, definitely, you're in. And of course, being a good programmer. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, which zone has the uh, highest generation failure rate? Which one is the hardest for us to keep getting? Ooh. I have a feeling there's a few areas in the old Act 3 uh, we do actually have um, automated testing of all the areas that tells us or warns us if any area or any graph in any area has a success rate below like 70% or 60% or something. Um, 
But there's only, only 30 or 40 out of 1,000 that actually have that problem. There are no areas with a success rate below 30%. Yeah, I can definitely tell you if you look at our logs right now and you're looking for generation issues, they're all blight generation issues. <laughs> Blighted maps were a challenge. Oh, yeah. Uh, what kind of uh, languages do we use to develop our world of map generation tools? And can we like, kind of talk about those tools and how we sort of go through that process a little bit? OK. The game itself is in C++. All the tools, well, all the terrain tools are also in C++. And I think. I made most of them uh, over the years. We do have a few other tools in C-sharp. Um, the environment artists use Maya to, to um, well, I guess the high poly guys might use something else, but the low poly comes through Maya and we have a custom tile exporter that converts all the geometry into a special file format for the game to load. And then we basically have a suite of custom tools to handle everything else. We have tools for editing the tiles and marking up all the tiles with connection points and stuff. We have a room editor that lets us assemble the rooms together um, out of the tiles, add decorations and so on. And then we have an overall, um, an overall terrain generation tool that generates areas, full areas that you can see from a bird's eye view. And for our, this is what our level designers will use um, to generate and test and explore. And it's also kind of integrated into the game a little bit. If you're in-game, well, if a, if a dev is in-game, and they find a problem, they can press F4, click a button, and open that exact level in a tool to see more information. And they can recreate the area over and over, look at the logs, um, and diagnose problems. Yeah, and I believe when uh, players do slash bug, we get that same information for recreating, right? Yes. When anyone types slash bug, we, uh, we log the seed and any critical information. Uh, I think we actually changed it so that it, when you type slash bug, we actually store like a literal cheat script that you can just copy and paste, and we can now immediately recreate all the level. Yeah, we definitely do. That's super useful. So if you find bugs, please slash bug them so I can repro them. Otherwise, it's sort of like <laughs> on that note, going around actually, in the dark. We, um, we recently changed the slash bug command so you can like type some stuff after it, give us some more information. Please use that. It's really useful, actually. <laughs> I think that's been in the game since like 3.7.0 now, and we keep telling people to do it, and they keep kind of missing the fact it's there. You know, when we were first implementing this, we were looking at, we actually looked at the logs. We discovered that some people were already doing that, even though it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we thought, oh, this is actually, this is actually a good, good idea. We, sh we should do this. You can also send us messages that way. <laughs> Don't. Please, just useful information, really. We have immediate regret. <laughs> uh, have you ever considered using the dynamic risk generation system to handle randomly, uh, random destructible objects? Uh, for example, a rower charging in a forest and knocking down trees in the trampled area would become traversable. We do actually support uh, objects that have blocking that can be turned on and off. For example, doors this is the most common example. Um, and, you know, originally, back in Act 2, the plan was for devourers to emerge from trees and destroy the tree as they emerged. But uh, that proved a little bit too challenging for um, version 1.2 or whatever it was. Yeah, but, uh, I mean, we could. We, we have the technology. Um, it's just a matter, of, a matter of implementing it and also designing the gameplay so that it's actually a meaningful thing that happens more than like 1% of the time. Like having a rower randomly shield charge into things, I mean, typically they're charging the player, so... I mean, they, they, I guess they, they do run into trees occasionally. Um, yeah, maybe we should do it. I'm game if you're game. Again, it's gameplay, so it's more your stuff, actually. <laughs> I've already implemented the technology, you just have to do it. All right. <laughs> 
I don't know that I should go confirming anything like that without Jonathan here. Um, yeah, and in fact, I believe the devourers were previously called root spiders, and it's still called a root spider in the code, which is very confusing for someone who's new to the game uh, code. Yeah, the number of times we've like had an, an initial name for something and then renamed it, and now everyone talks about the official name that you see in game, and all the art assets use a completely different name. Yeah. Yep, I mentioned earlier when I was chatting to some of the players that uh, in-game Blade Flurry is called Charged Attack, and Whirling Blades is called Blade Flurry, which is very easy to, to understand. Yeah, don't forget new, new, new Shield Charge. <laughs> Seriously, Shield Charge is the worst. <laughs> we've, re we've rebuilt it from the ground up like three times, and it still crashes somehow. Uh, yeah. My favorite is uh, for the uh, spectral shield throw, the uh, projectiles, because there's a second set of projectile. It's called spectral shield throw projectile projectile. <laughs> that doesn't surprise me. It was also me that did it. Uh, will uh, seamless zone transitions ever be possible with the current infrastructure? This is kind of slightly outside of terrain generation, but. That is a tricky one. Um, I mean, of course it would be nice, but it, it really is a massive task to implement something like that. We need some sort of streaming asset loading. Um, I mean, you, you've probably seen games where they use, you know, an elevator ride or various um, switchback turns to hide the fact that they're removing geometry behind you and adding new stuff in front of you. Um, our system really does not support that at the moment. Uh, I don't know, maybe Path of Exile 3. <laughs> Someone did say, was it, maybe, I think it was Eric said Path of Exile 3 the other day, <laughs> and we all cringed backstage. Maybe. Uh, I don't 100% understand this question, but maybe you will. Uh, Delve, is it possible to implement generating new instances like we have it in the Act Zones now? Oh, I just understood it as I talked about it. Uh, Delve is a very special snowflake. Uh, it, took, it took a bit of effort to bring all that together. Um, combining different tile sets together that were not really designed to fit together was a bit of a challenge. So that whole incredibly powerful room overlap feature I talked about, yeah, no. We're not using that for Delve. We have special connection tiles between all the different biomes. Um, we actually do generate a new Delve instance every time you enter uh, the mine encampment. Well, from town uh, or from hideout. One of the features that we talked about for Delve was that, so players have worked out there's a five by five grid, right? And a few leagues after Delve, we actually extended that. So it doesn't have to be a five by five grid because some, some of the delve paths are actually longer than five tiles, five, uh, five cells. So it can also be eight by four or um, eight by four, yes. Or it can, it can be a rectangular shape as well if, if, if the path is especially long. But um, I mean, it's pretty rare. Uh, one of the features we did talk about for delve was that if you reach the edge of the grid, what, what happens? Um, we wanted to have an entrance that you could click on and continue playing. However, in practice, you would be in darkness at that point. If there was a, um, if there was light, like you're going back along the lit path, well, you can just teleport to places you've been in Delve, so it's not really needed for that. So if you were exploring into the darkness, um, there's kind of a few issues, like how long is your loading screen? Are you sitting in darkness that whole time? Like, grace period? Um, what if you want to go back? Like, the, it wasn't an easy thing. So we, we, we decided not to implement that for Delve League, and we would um, basically listen to player feedback, and if people really wanted it, then maybe we'd implement it. But generally, people seem pretty happy with Delve. Awesome. Um, let's briefly kind of talk about the way that we sustain our quality with all of the generation tools and the map stuff. Like, what kind of testing systems do we have through the build and, and to ensure that nothing nasty gets live? 
Well, we do have um, automatic testing of all the areas to make sure that they successfully generate and have a reasonable success rate. Um, we do have lots of metrics, lots of statistics about how big is the area, how many monsters spawned, how many treasure chests spawned, how many expected loot drops are there in the entire level, and these sort of things. And we do try to standardize those for in-game maps. However, we sort of changed our ideology a little bit there, so now, you know, we nerfed Strand. Sorry. It's too good. It was just too good. Um, so for things like in-game maps, we do have to care about the layout, how linear it is, um, so that some maps, like, it's not good if there's only two maps that are just the best maps and that's all anyone plays. We want people to play a variety of maps. And so sometimes we have to nerf things and buff things, but yeah. Awesome. Uh, has there been any consideration to applying the procedural generation techniques to hideouts to make them a little bit more varied and interesting for the players? We specifically do not have any randomization of hideouts. They actually use a fixed seed. And the reason for this is because players customize their hideouts. Like, people place doodads and they line them up very carefully. Um, if we randomly pull a train out from under them, like, what's, what's the point? It doesn't, the whole system just doesn't work. So even, even things like the grass and the ground materials, things that have no effect on gameplay, um, we're very careful to not randomize those for hideouts so that people can place all the doodads where they want, they can create hideout templates and share them. Um, we want to make sure that all that stuff works. All right, uh, next up, have we made any considerations for using artificial intelligence in the world generation process to kind of cut out a little bit of the human element for it? We don't really use AI. Um, it's kind of complex enough as it is. Like, there are literally tens of thousands of lines of code in the terrain generation already. Um, making such a big change at this point, well, I mean, it's quite difficult. There are certain things where you can use AI techniques to create effects, and that's more of the visual stuff that Alexander Senekov is doing, I think. But the, the core terrain generation, yeah, I, I think we're good. All right, let's see what else we can find in here. Uh, have we given more consideration to uh, using wider camera angles, and what kind of uh, problems can that cause for you with the generation? For example, the Katava boss fight is the classic example. So I think in Path of Exile 2, we did pull the camera out a little bit. And maybe we changed the field of view. Yeah, we did. Yeah. This, in general, is a bit risky for performance. Um, the game is designed around the camera angle in terms of how much stuff we're hiding in the background at the sides of the screen and everything. So adding more geometry on screen does have a penalty. But we did manage to find a good compromise for Path of Exile 2, where every area is designed around the new camera angle. Um, there are a, f a, few, uh, a few fixed locations where we specifically zoom the camera out, like for a boss fight or something. And we, we can technically do that anywhere, but we have to be careful about uh, where we do it because we need the terrain to support that zoomed out um, perspective. For sure, and if you're particularly interested in that and you didn't catch the world building talk with Eric yesterday, we talked a little bit more about that at the same time and how that affected his process. Uh, that's probably about all the time we have for questions for the time being, though. If you guys have any other questions, feel free to come find us around the convention. We're all floating around, or there's plenty of other stuff. But otherwise, have a great convention. Thank you.